Well, that was an easy act to follow, wasn't it? Step one, I'm having to remind myself, I can. But right now, I'm not so sure after listening to Sarah. So let's see, can I? No, I can't. I can. I'm going to talk about something that is not impossible at all. This is especially for the students, but actually it's for all of us. And that's what I call restoring the culture of freedom. You say, well, why do we need to restore it? It's already here. Well, let's, let's talk about that. But just last week, the Secretary of State, John Kerry, was uh, in Cairo. And he was meeting with the Egyptian leaders, and his theme was restoration. Restoration of democracy. And he talked about the need to allow political dissent, just allow people to speak out. This is not unusual. Here, we're going to go around the world in 60 seconds. Burma, right now. If you're a Muslim in Burma, watch out. You're probably going to be persecuted. You're probably going to be facing violence. Iraq, watch out. If you're a Christian in Iraq, you're probably going to be persecuted. You're probably going to be facing violence. I'll do what the good professor did. It did. Kenya, the president of Kenya and the deputy president are under indictment in the International Criminal Court. The charge, it's a charge. It hasn't been tried yet the murder of many political opponents and their supporters. It's the president of the country. Argentina, one would think, what could be going wrong there? The Washington Post editorialized just last week. There is a terrific, horrific governmental assault on freedom of the press, especially Grupo Claro. China. What can we say? The most recent reports are bloggers are now in a whole lot of trouble. And the latest reports also indicate that journalists are undergoing indoctrination in Marxist principles. Journalists. Saudi Arabia, you read that last week a Kuwaiti woman was arrested in Saudi because she was driving her sick father to the hospital. It's a crime for a woman to drive her father. How did we get this way? How can this be in the 21st century? Let's go back in time and, and recall that after World War II and, and literally seven weeks after the surrender of Germany and with, with the unfolding atrocities of the Holocaust, the unbelievable events of the Holocaust, and just the horrific loss of life and the fabulous poem we just heard on Hiroshima. After all that, 51 nations came together in San Francisco. And they were basically saying, we've got to do this better. We've got to build a different kind of world than we've had thus far in the 20th century. And read this wonderful language in the charter. We are determined to reaffirm faith. How about that? A faith word in fundamental human rights in the dignity and worth of the human person, in the equal rights of men and women, and in nations, and of nations, large and small. And then three years later, Universal Declaration of, of Human Rights, and the US delegation was led by a woman, Eleanor Roosevelt, and the 30 articles of the Universal Declaration lifting up these towering objectives. Well, things are not going well. As our quick 60 second review of the world showed, things are really not good. Freedom House. In its 2013 report, Freedom House, which is dedicated to freedom from every human being, man, woman, child, everywhere, said last year, 27 countries in the world suffered from a loss of freedoms. 27 countries. This is the seventh straight year in the world that there's been a diminution rather than an expansion of freedom. You say, well, move to Switzerland. 
you know, after being here for about 18 hours, I, I'm ready. We say, well, wait a second, it's a small country and you're an American. So, well, we can't, you know, there's 7 billion people, so not everybody can move to Switzerland. But, but what do you have in Switzerland? You, you, you do have rule of law, you have freedoms enshrined in, in a constitution, but you've got a beautiful country, but there are only 8 million people here. What about the other 7 billion people? Well, our hopes, our dreams in America are, can we have our culture of freedom when there's so many issues with respect to, to our own freedoms and liberties as free people? Can we have, look at, look at what we said in, in America, in the United States, I should say, of America. We hold these truths to be self-evident. That all men, and now we would say all men and women, are created equal. They're endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. And among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Or our preamble to our constitution. We the people. In order to form a more perfect union. And then look how the preamble ends. And to secure the blessings. Liberty is a blessing. The blessing of liberty to ourselves, but they were also looking down the corridors of time our posterity. Tocqueville came to the United States in the 1830s and he saw a remarkable explosion of law, of freedom, and equality, where wealth mattered so much less than it did in his native France, that voices were listened to as he traveled around the country, even the voices of those who weren't educated and who weren't poor because there was this sense of shared dignity of humanity. Well, not long ago, I was in a taxi cab in New York, and I always love to ask the cabbies or drivers, you know, where are you from? Because you can tell, they're usually, I'm from Texas, you can tell if you're from Texas, but they're not from Texas, well, well where are you from? And uh, he said, I'm from Albania. And I said, oh, Albania, it's beautiful Eastern, Eastern European, but you've been through a lot, I know, in your country. But why did you come here? He said, I came for freedom. He said, you can eat bread anywhere. But in America, you can eat bread in freedom. Well, that's a question for Americans. Can we? Well, we have for your generation great expectations. Great expectations that you're going to be freedom fighters. And so I have five suggestions. So suggestion number one, steep yourselves in the intellectual foundations of freedom. They're ancient. Read Aristotle's politics. Read Plato. You're not going to agree with everything, especially in the Republic, but I hope that you're doing that. If you haven't, you need to steep yourself in the intellectual foundations of freedom. Milton in the 17th century. Locke and Burke. Read these great architects of freedom, and Burke in particular because he believed in the idea of ordered liberty. If you think you're a libertarian, think twice. <laughs> Because we have to live in community, and that means that there will be rules and regulations. The question is, do we all have a voice in terms of what those rules and regulations are? Are those simply imposed upon us without listening to our voices? Freedom, when you reflect upon it, is really a cluster of interrelated rights. Obviously, freedom of speech, freedom of press, of conscience and religion, and not just worship, but of religious practice of association. We've got to be able to associate with, with, with one another, but it also, frankly, means at times the right to say, you know, I don't think, we're the Girl Scouts. I don't think you belong here. So that's, that, and that's hard because we love equality, but freedom means that we've got to be able to associate with one another and bring together those wonderful institutions that the sociologists call intermediating institutions that intermediate between the individual and the state or the government. And then this is neglected all too much in the 21st century, and that is freedom of commerce. The Pursuit of Happiness, the Declaration of Happiness, was actually a play on the Lockean principle of life, liberty, and property. You have the right to pursue as a free person your role in commerce. That might be the nonprofit world, but you're going to be in commerce. You're going to be 
doing something in the world of commerce. By the way, I love this device. This tells me when my time runs out, but it's so small, I can't read it. <laughs> Thank you. And could you move it over a little bit? Because I'm really warming to this subject. So point number two, before they get the hook, point number two, persuade and educate. We can all do that after we've steeped ourselves. Oh, she's changing that. Shame on you. <laughs> persuade and educate. Because you know what? There are going to be threats to freedom at every turn. Oh, you are diabolical. <laughs> Could you turn it back to 50? <laughs> you can't start over again. Well, here is something to remember. Power corrupts. As soon as you hold power, watch out. I've been accused of that. And it's important for anyone who holds power to be mindful that power can corrupt. This is Lord Atkins and then absolute power. That's why we have to have checks and balances. And so you've steeped yourself in the intellectual tradition. And then you say, OK, I've got to persuade and I've got to educate. In other words, I may have to be in politics. I hope you don't think that's ugly. But if you do, get over it. <laughs> Because you're too smart, you're too able, you're too gifted. You've got to be, because Aristotle said, it is the highest form of human endeavor. I don't agree with that, but it sure is a high form of human endeavor, and it's very important, especially if we want to restore a culture of freedom. That also means freedom in the polity, in the polis, as Aristotle would put it. It also may mean that you're going to have to conscientiously object. You know, it takes courage to conscientiously object. Gandhi changed much of the world, South Africa, India, with his simple example, and note that it was nonviolent. He conscientiously objected to oppression. In my own country, Dr. King, influenced by scripture, influenced by Gandhi. And by the way, he changed. He changed the name of the Southern Leadership Conference when he became its leader of the Southern Christian leadership conference, he said, we're nonviolent. That the Christian worldview is a nonviolent worldview. And look what he did with his conscientious objective. He hit the heart of a nation that saw the evils of the continuing quasi-apartheid and led through the democratic process, yes, through politics, to the passage, and we'll celebrate this next year, the 50th anniversary of the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Oh, isn't Malala a great example for it? This little girl was shot in the face by the Taliban in the Swat Valley in Pakistan, nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. And what was her crime? She believed in the equality of women and the education of women. Bless her heart. She continues to speak out for the Dignity of every human being. So be a freedom culture builder, a freedom fighter, without resorting to arms. We have to work together to restore the culture of freedom. You may say, well, what can I do? Well, this is a, a photograph of a guy walking with his little boy. And you probably know the story, father and son on the beach, and there are a whole bunch of starfish that have washed up, and the dad picks up one and tosses it into the, into the water, and the son says, but, but dad, there's so many. Why did you do that? And the dad says, we can all do something. We can do something. We may not be a Gandhi, but we can be a soldier for freedom, again, without being arms. And I use one example, the International Justice Mission. Here is one human being who was called upon in 1995 to go to Rwanda under the auspices of the United Nations. And what was Gary Haugen's mission? It was to do forensic research to support charges for crimes against humanity being brought against Rwandan leaders in the wake of the genocide of 1994. I've heard him speak of what he saw. Out of 11 million people, 1 million were killed by their neighbors, and in the most atrocious ways. Man's inhumanity to humanity just seems to know no bounds. 
So he could have simply returned to his life as a senior lawyer in the Civil Rights Division of the Justice Department and doing very important and noble work, but he said, I've got to do something more than that because this is a hurting world and I've got to help restore a culture of freedom and dignity. And so he started an international justice mission. And from that one person, one person, now supported by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and by individuals, that international justice mission, working to restore the culture of freedom in broken places around the world, and there's no place that's not broken. Now 16 countries have them as, as a presence. And there are 150 IJM chapters, including at Baylor, where I'm so privileged and blessed to serve, who do what? They focus on the needs of some of the world's neediest people in terms of oppression, the victims. The next suggestion is train yourself for leadership. That's what you're doing here at the school. I'm suggesting you be very intentional that leadership is learned. It is a learned skill set. And there are different ways of doing it. I hope you're focusing on leadership classes because you want to do what? You want to be able to pour yourselves into those around you, empower them so that they in turn will accomplish more and they will become soldiers for freedom or whatever that passion is. And by the way, one of the things, especially in a cynical age, I had to lift this up in thinking about leadership. In his valedictory at the Kennedy Institute of Politics, after he left the United States Senate, the cowboy senator from Wyoming, Alan Simpson. And I heard these words, and I will always remember these words. The audience was absolutely, the, the auditorium was jam-packed as Senator Simpson was saying farewell to the Kennedy Institute at the Kennedy School of Government. He closed with these words in politics, if you don't have integrity, you don't have anything. He's a man of integrity. You can agree with him or you can disagree with him on a particular policy, but what you knew when the cowboy senator spoke is you can take what he said to the bank because he means it. We need men and women in politics, in life, who have this kind of rock-ribbed integrity. My final observation is your generation really needs to be an entrepreneur. You say, what does that have to do with freedom? It has everything to do with freedom. You may be an entrepreneur like Gary Haugen, who creates his own nonprofit, and I love seeing that on college campuses. Whatever the college campus is in North America, you're seeing it. Entrepreneurs in nonprofits and yes, okay, in the for-profit world. You say, again, what does that have to do with freedom? Because you know what? Entrepreneurs are freedom fighters. To be an entrepreneur is an act of freedom. You're obviously going to promote human flourishing and human prosperity. But it is an act of freedom itself, which then has a feedback loop and then encourages the society around them to be more freedom-minded. Entrepreneurship is something that we have to lift up. Your generation is doing it. I encourage you because guess what? In doing that, you're promoting and restoring a culture of freedom. They've now put this horrible time machine right here. And it says, your red light is on, buddy. And so... I close with Steve Jobs. This was Steve's great message to Stanford, not too terribly long before his death. Don't let the noise of others' opinions drown out your own inner voice. And most important, there's a key word, have the courage to follow your heart and intuition. Help restore the culture of freedom. Thank you.